Welcome, panel. Everyone feeling all right? Heart rate come yeah, down a little bit? Yeah, good. Just please be careful on these chairs. Um, thank you guys for offering. I know it's a pretty daunting thing, isn't it, suddenly sitting in front of everyone. So we really appreciate it. But I think everyone will understand in, in a moment, you know, how brilliant the impact is that the projects that you guys are involved in and the work that you do so we really wanted to celebrate that and thank you um, but hopefully through some of the questions um, this morning we'll be able to unpick a little bit of that so you can provide a little bit more detail to inspire other people in the room so to start off with we just want you to do a very brief Stuart um, introduction um, of who you are and what you do Florence are we okay to start with you Hello, I'm Florence de Tonga Thomas. I'm the kind of Maisel Carter. Um, that's a kind of a one to elevate the voices of ethnically and culturally diverse communities in Gloucestershire. That is through education, events, and training for equitable futures. So we do this with different organs for our need for now. If you can make kiss. I'm Sinead, and I teach martial arts in Boston. So I do everything from taking kids to European championships and winning gold medals. But one of the core things that I do is I create a really safe space for people from all different backgrounds to be able to come together and do martial arts. So we're kind of more of a family community based group as opposed to martial arts is almost a second dairy thing that we, we sort of focus on. Um, and one of my big things is just removing the barriers from being able to access those in those smaller things. I'm a, a warrior, I'm an anxious person, and I find it really hard to join new things. So in our club, we really try to, you know, tell you what the room's going to look like before you get there. You know, really remove those tiny things. And actually, we've seen a huge increase in, especially... There we're, we're quite friendly. We look kicking people in the head, but we also, you know, we, we're, we're a friendly, friendly bunch at the same time, so... Thanks, Sinead. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name's Josh Jones. I'm the learning manager for Barnwood Trust. Uh, Barnwood Trust is a funder and also a social change agent. Um, and yeah, we work along disabled, alongside disabled people and people with mental health conditions to create, um, yeah, to make Gloucester the best possible place for disabled people. Hi, I'm uh, Stuart Langworthy. I'm a founder and president of uh, Abbey Mead Rovers Football Club. And we introduced walking football to the club 10 years ago and we started our impairment group, the Pirates, two years ago. And uh, I'm also the England over 60s walking football manager for my sins. So, Hi, my name's Ian Preston. I'm a social prescriber at Hadwin and Quedgley Primary Care Network uh, and also the founder of Health Life Fitness, uh, which is a education, lifestyle and fitness uh, organisation which basically helps people improve their overall functional fitness and health and well-being. Perfect, guys. Thank you. So I'm just going to start off with um, one question for each of you. Obviously, we had a chat beforehand, so hopefully you know a little bit about the questions I'm going to ask. Florence, if I can start with you. Obviously, you didn't give too much away at the beginning, but I just wondered if you were able to share a little bit about the Swimmers of Colour project, but I guess particularly picking up on um, what the perceived barriers are for people when they think about engaging black women, particularly in swimming, and actually what your project did to break, break a lot of these down? I, I mentioned that we, we run different programs and we, Swimmers of Colour falls under our health and well-being theme. And it was quite interesting because I remember uh, when I first spoke to Lizzie about it, or when I first, came, oh, you know, the idea came and I said, I shared it with women on a WhatsApp group. And I wasn't sure how it was going to go or it was going to be received. But I was really surprised that within five minutes of putting it out there, all the places, 10 spaces went. And it's like, okay, what's going on here? And there were more people wanting to join the program, but we could, you know, it was like, okay, that's all the spaces we've got. Then decided, okay, you know, what is the issues? Was really surprised when I spoke to Jan and, t t you know, looking at the statistics, is it 95% of black adults yeah. cannot swim? So it was like, okay. This is really, really interesting. And what does that mean for a community? It means people can't do not exercise. Swimming is a skill, most importantly. But then it's a workout. You can spend time with your family. You, you've got your kids. Uh, you know, when you go on holidays, the stories we've heard from the, from the women themselves, that they would go on holidays, but what happens? They sit on the side. They are not able to enjoy, to join in. So it just made, you know, even I remember the first session because one of the things we did is like um, 
working with Jan, who's from a swim design space, is a, a, did a Zoom call in order to have conversations. So what is the issues around swimming and where, why do we have these barriers? Because it, it's not affecting the skills, you know, it's a family. And how can we get people active and enjoying what they do? So uh, the conversations uh, became about, you know, just the idea it's not accessible to the communities. It's not some, if you didn't grow up with it, how do you know that that's that spot's for you? And how does that then encourage you to even pay for swimming lessons for your kids? So it's an exclusion that is sometimes found over generations. And for this reason, it made the project really bring people together, bring the women together. We worked with the 10 women and we brought them together. Um, we had, you know, we, we went out as well. So the bonding within the, you know, bringing, you know, just health and well-being mentally when it's, it's really difficult. Sometimes people are, you know, balancing quite difficult issues. And the most surprising thing, even when it snowed in December, everybody turned up, isn't it, Jen? <laughs> and it's like, you know, you'd expect that people to say, oh, no, let, let's just let it go. But people still turned up. So through that program, we've learned quite a lot. And we're already running the second session this year in Gloucester, which has, is going very well. And we've in, incorporated um, exercise with it, going absolutely fantastic. And uh, when we were working with communities, it's about thinking about just, OK, how can we bring people in to be part of something big and instead of taking assumptions? Ask the questions, um, reach out and engage, whether it's in school, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, <clears throat> if you're doing any specific activity and you think, okay, how come what we're doing, we can't reach the community? Um, I personally don't like the terminology hard to reach because the communities are there. Why are hard to reach? We need to ask ourselves, what are we not doing that makes it a community hard to reach or a community of interest. What's that? We need to, uh, you know, not use those terminologies at all because that doesn't take us far. Is what tools do we have? Which organization can we work with in order to reach the communities if those are the barriers that, that makes, you know, makes it impossible for some communities not to access the services that we do offer as organizations? So if we start thinking about what we're doing and who's missing and who else can we reach out to, because in collaboration, you can achieve quite a lot. In collaboration, we managed to really be impactful in Gloucestershire. And working with Active Gloucestershire has been amazing. The support we received from the beginning has meant that, to be honest, um, the program was covered uh, apart from um, on TV, even in the Midlands. So it wasn't just the Southwest that, that you know, it was shown on TV, but also the Midlands. So, and we've had inquiries from Coventry and Birmingham, if they can come join us to swim. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't know, we might have to find some tech equipment to fly them in, some drone or something. <laughs> Let them in and out. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Flores. And you're so passionate. I love speaking to you about this project. So there will be more questions, which I'm sure you'll get lots more out of it. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Yes, great. Thank you, Florence. So, Josh, I have a question for you. Um, so, needs a microphone. Lovely, thank you. So, the Barnwood Trust have been doing some great work in thinking about how to reduce and remove barriers for disabled people to access nature. Yeah, exactly. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more around some of the barriers that were identified in mm -hmm. disabled people being able, being able to access nature and also what approach it was the Barnwood Trust took to hopefully overcome some of those? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I think it's really nice to be on a panel talking about inequalities um, and access to nature because I think um, for a lot of disabled people um, and people with mental health conditions and neurodivergent people, um, you know, we often hear that, you know, well, we know about the effects that nature um, can have on us, the positive effects. Um, and there's lots of conversations um, around that across the county nationally. Um, but 
you know, there's really a lack of research around, um, you know, looking at um, what the barriers are in terms of accessing nature and it's, um, you know, and looking at research and speaking to disabled people. Um, yeah, it's um, access to nature is not equal. You know, um, there are so many disabling barriers to accessing nature. So what Barmer Trust has done, um, we've looked at research. Um, we've also spoken to uh, uh, yeah, a large number of disabled people in the county about what what are the barriers? And um, yeah, there are there are many. I think some of them are a lot um, harder to um, tackle than others. But um, examples of barriers include um, infrastructure. So when we think about access and accessibility, we often think about um, physical access to um, to sites. So um, yeah, and, and, and by sites, I'm talking about you know national trust and talking about um, Tewkesbury Nature Reserve, but also um, local parks and, and so on as well. So um, yeah, infrastructure is a big issue. Um, things like pathways, um, yeah, ramps, physical things, toilets, often not there, so people do not um, go. I think a really important one that um, this work has been able to highlight is um, barriers in a lack of information and inaccessible information, so communication. So. Um, you can have the most accessible, kind of physically accessible um, site or, or place in nature um, in the county, but if you're not um, communicating that, um, then it's a problem. Um, and so, um, yeah, a, a really a major barrier. A lot of disabled people told us they don't know, you know, if they don't know that there's an accessible toilet, they're not going to risk it. Um, transport is a massive one, massive barrier. I'm sure there are lots of people in the room um, <laughs> where transport comes up as a huge barrier to um, accessing many things. Um, and also, um, although it's not perhaps a disabling barrier, but a lot of people just talked about low confidence and also anxiety around, um, well, well, if you think about all those barriers um, and, and poor experiences of, of going out in nature and particularly disabling barriers in, res in, um, yeah, in terms of attitudes towards people. So, um, you know, we heard from um, families with... Um, autistic and neurodivergent children who get judged and treated poorly and staff not being trained on how to, you know, um, yeah, to welcome and um, these families. And so it puts people off, you know, one bad experience somewhere can put um, people off going. So yeah, we were hearing about that, you know, through research and so on. And so Barma Trust, we don't work with individuals. Um, but what we did think is that we could make an impact here through working with organizations. Um, so in 2022, we um, convened a group of um, organizations working in green and blue spaces, whether they had sites themselves or whether they were kind of providing services or, 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 or working alongside people in nature. Um, we brought them together to disseminate some of that research and also to hear about what, some, what, what they need to make their sites more accessible. Um, and that was really, really interesting. Um, people talked about wanting to hear more directly from disabled people about removing the barriers. And um, so we, we, it's really interesting as well. I think Barma Trust often the conversation starts with funding, but for this particular piece of work, it didn't start with funding. Actually, it started with learning. People wanted to know how to remove the barriers, what were the barriers. Um, and so we launched a learning program. So in 2023, last year, um, we had a yeah we worked with some amazing um, organizations learning providers um, like activity Alliance I know they're in the room today um, inclusion Gloucestershire Andrew Lansley um, and yeah it was we put on this learning program for um, over 20 um, professionals from different organizations um, and yeah people learn about the barriers um, and yeah how to remove them and so um, this year we launched the access to nature network where those there's um, people from the learning program and are part of a network. There's lots of peer learning, lots of peer support. Um, Barma Trust isn't actually doing that much. We're facilitating it because there's so much learning. And um, yeah, and so that's that's been really been our approach. So we're seeing a lot of impact already in terms of communications. There's organizations producing um, acce more accessible um, communication on their websites, ac accessibility guides. Um, we're also seeing... Um, yeah, collaboration as well across um, the sector, which is, you know, key. And if Florence talked about collaboration, partnership working, I think that's really key in the solution. So, yeah, we're, we're learning as a trust, and then um, we're going to see what we, we can do with this learning and probably share it 
um, later this year at an event. So, yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Josh. So, Ian, if you can take the mic. Yeah. Um, Obviously, your, the project that you're involved in is, is a brilliant link between healthcare and the community. Um, I wondered if you could share um, around the successes of how you secured that partnership um, and, I guess, some of the key learnings that you've learned along the way. Okay, so I think that the, we did a 12-week program, health and, and well-being program, but it initially came about when I, I heard a quote that uh, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. And then that laid, laid, made me think about the role that we have as social prescribers, because we know that within primary care and secondary care, uh, people's lifestyle choices and those wider determinants, their support networks, where they live, transport, et cetera, have a very big influence on their health. And then I sort of thought, well, surgeries are pretty much reactive. Patients come to see us, but what can we do to be proactive within a community setting? So I approached Active Gloucestershire to say, look, I've got this idea. Uh, I'd like to run a, a program, but we need some funding. And uh, what we looked at was had a chat with some of the patients that were coming in to see me in my social prescribing role. And I said, what would you be interested in if you wanted to improve your overall health and well-being and sort of fitness and things? Uh, and these were predominantly older people because they, they tend to be the ones that are less physically active uh, and have more sort of inequalities that they can sort of deal with. So um, it, the, the feedback was that we'd like something where we could learn about how to get fitter, learn about lifestyle choices. So a bit of a, an information education component and something around fitness as well, but not just to do it, to learn how to do it so that we could go away and then make more informed choices about our own lifestyles to improve. Things like long-term conditions, like diabetes, for example, can be, could be really well managed if you make really good lifestyle choices. So approach Active Gloss, cap in hand, um, and yeah, we, we got some funding from Sport England to, to run the program. Uh, we contacted uh, patients to see if they were interested. The age ranges we looked at were 65 to 80 year olds. Uh, what we wanted to do as well, in terms of inequalities, is we, we looked at focusing first on those areas of sort of health and social economic deprivation. So we contacted those patients to say, look, are you interested in attending this program? Uh, we left that for a while and then we moved on to other people from there. So we wanted to give those people a really good shout to, to come along. Unfortunately, we only had spaces for about 50 people. Uh, but when I looked at the, the surgeries, sort of numbers of people that had been, older people that had been deconditioned over sort of COVID, et cetera, while well, we had spaces for 50, in one surgery alone, there were eligible 1,600 people, which just goes to show the scope you know, of, of, uh, of need there as well. So we got the funding um, and uh, we ran a 12 week program uh, over the summer holidays, which I wouldn't recommend anyone doing because it's pretty hot. And that involved um, sort of 12 sessions, like I said. So half of that was around education and information that could be around lifestyle. So we talked about diet, nutrition, sleep, stress, different types of exercise, because it's often grounded in a particular area. So we looked at what is strength, what is power, what is flexibility, aerobic fitness as well. Um, and we did pre and post tests with most of the participants because we wanted to look at any clinical changes that would happen before. So those were around things like um, overall strength, power, flexibility, and functional mobility. Uh, and there were really good results that came back from there. So that, that was very, very good. Um, ran the sessions with the physical activity, uh, things we went from sort of martial arts, tai chi, salsa, strength training, balance training, always with a bit of fun. I just wish you'd been framed was still on because I could have made 250 quid <laughs> just like that. It was it was so easy. Um, yeah, so so that 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 was the program, uh, but also thinking about you know what were the aims and objectives, and at the end of it, because many programs sort of run and then funding stops and then people just go and obviously with deconditioning again you've spent 12 weeks getting fitter and now you're going to do nothing so you're going to slide back down again so where where could we go from there how is it self-sustainable um so the program then finished uh but we restarted again with people that were coming in uh as a pay-as-you-go scheme and that's now increased from one class to three classes but it also from a surgery's perspective to be proactive gave us that impetus to say actually let's try something a bit different. 
So in January, we ran a Women's Health Day where we got consultants in to do various talks, and we had over 200 women turned up to that one, which was really good. Uh, and two weeks ago, at the surgery itself, we ran a Health and Wellbeing Day, talking around various things, dementia, pain management, prostate health, uh, weight management, etc. And we had over 200 people that, that turned up for that. And we were doing blood checks. So some people found out that they, they, they had diabetes, but they weren't even aware of it. So that, that proactive approach, I think, is really, really important. Um, and the key lessons from there are just, just try things and, and see what sort of comes out from it. But giving people the knowledge and understanding for them to be able to make their own informed decisions is really, really important. Thanks, Ian. There's so many golden nuggets from just the, the one question that you guys have had so far. So we'll carry on down. So Stuart, question for you. Um, so Abermead Rovers, which is obviously where you come from, and the walking football setup has been going from strength to strength, as you alluded to earlier. Could you tell us um, a little bit more about the Pirates session, which is your impairment session, and what it is that you did that created that genuine, inclusive community or family, as you sometimes refer to it as? Um, yeah, it, it all started during lockdown, really, when I was asked to run a, a We Are Undefeatable virtual campaign. And then following that, we wanted to bring that more locally, so approached uh, Active Gloucestershire and had some funding. Uh, we now have five sessions of walking football at Abbey Mead Rovers to meet different needs. But the Pirates uh, was set up just over two years ago now. Um, and what we wanted to do was to uh, encourage people with various health conditions to just come along and have a bit of fun with us. And it, what's, what's happened is it's become less about the football and more about the community, more about the group, as we call them, the family. Um, and in that two years, we've gone from something like six people, I think our record at the moment is 45 in a week. We've almost outgrown ourselves. Um, we have a huge variety of, of health conditions. We have some with Parkinson's, recovering from stroke, heart attack. Um, we've started having people coming from care homes with their carers as well, and they come on the pitch and join us as well. Anyone who turns up to come and watch what we do is given a pair of boots and told to come on and join in. So you can join in the fun as well, and some of you have experienced that in here. Um, we have people from 30-something to 82, if you ever get into a conversation with Brian, you'll be there till next week. Um, it's, it's just brilliant. No one is judged. Uh, everyone just is accepted for who they are and what they are. They come along. They have a bit of fun. The first half an hour is more about uh, just general fitness. We do strength. We do conditioning. That sounds, sounds a bit too much. Actually, what we do is we work on balance, coordination, and things like that. Um, we do it. So we have a good warm-up of just general activity for the first 15, 20 minutes. Um, we then play a, a short game of walking football. What we've now been able to do is to split our pitch into two. So we have the less mobile on one pitch and the more mobile on another pitch. Uh, the rules are kind of made up as we go along. I referee most weeks and various people always seem to get penalties and they always seem to score. So they go away with a smile on their faces, which is really important. And we all go for a tea or coffee afterwards, and that's the most important thing as well. What we've done is we've built up this, this community of people who can all feel safe in that environment. They all come along and have fun, and they all stay for a drink and have chat afterwards. Uh, we've got them all set up on a WhatsApp group, so there's that support. We heard the other day that one of them had started to have a few falls, and he wouldn't be coming for a couple of weeks, and immediately he had 30 or 40 messages of support. Um, we've identified the barriers, things like transport, and we've got volunteers who will go and collect people. Uh, the surface we play on was a barrier, so we bought football boots to make sure that we could break those barriers down. And just anyone's welcome, really. We're almost at the point where we need more time and more volunteers to, to expand what we're doing. We've helped set up sessions in Sirencester, and we're looking to sort of try and use our model, if you like, to set up sessions in different places. Uh, we're starting to see people recommended to come to us because we think that physical activity is probably the best medication that people can get. And I suppose just to finish up, um, we have great fun. And that's the most important thing, that people who come along feel that they're part of a community, feel that they're part of a family, and they have great fun every week. Brilliant. Thank you, Stuart.
And then finally then on to Sinead. Um, when we spoke about your project and what I hear a lot about your project is how it's created that inclusive environment, particularly for young people. And when we chatted, you said how um, young people tend to stay on into adulthood. And actually that goes against a lot of the trends that we know about drop-off rates for young people. So can you just talk to us a little bit about why your club's so great at retaining young people and what the environment is that you provide for them? So I think one of the things I didn't realise growing up, I grew up in Ireland. I'm, inclusive is not really a word we use because it's kind of something we just do naturally. I had an aunt who had Down syndrome. I went to school with people with varying disabilities. And it sort of was just a thing that was in my community. So I never thought about it. And 12 years ago, I moved to Gloucester and I was working as a sports coach. And I had people ask me questions like, oh, are you qualified to teach people with disabilities? Or um, are, how do you know how to do these things? And I was like, well, I, don't understand. I don't understand the question. I don't understand why I'm a, I'm a sports coach. I'm a martial arts teacher. I can do those things. And I just adapt to whoever comes into my sessions. So I sort of, I took over a little martial arts club when I moved to Gloucester 12 years ago, which had about, I think about six kids. And the kids were the, um, they were the children of the dads who trained in the adult class who only got out with a free pass from their wives if they took the kids with them. So it was kind of like this <laughs> kind of disorganized chaos. And I kind of took it over and sort of nurtured it. But I've just adapted to everyone who's coming through the door. So I've, I've got people of all different backgrounds from just the most shy person you've ever met. I've had a child who turned up for eight weeks before they ever stepped foot in the door and they just stared through the little glass window. But I just kept on and just kind of kept trying to remove the barriers, but not in like an overbearing sort of way. And our club is sort of just, I didn't set out to be a martial arts instructor full time. I didn't set out to do it. And it sort of just kept growing and growing. I don't do marketing. I don't do advertising. Most of the time I tell you I have no idea what I'm doing. But I can teach martial arts and I can really embrace the differences in my clubs. And with some of my older teenagers, one of them recently told me that one of the things they love about coming to our club, and they've, they've been there for, I think, about 10 years so far. And she basically told me that her favorite thing is, is that when she comes to the club, she can be herself. Whereas when she's in school, she has to be this person because she's perceived to be the smart one and the quiet one. So therefore, she conforms to that. When she goes to her swimming classes, she's, a, she's an elite swimmer. So she needs to conform to the fact that she's a really good athlete and she has to play into that role. And then she comes to our class and she's, she's silly, but she's really good at what she does and she really enjoys it. And I think we, we ultimately, we just have fun with it. And I've kind of had a model where it kind of breaks down the barriers of a lot of martial arts. A lot of martial arts are very straight lines you have to do exactly what you're told and you have to be able to do things in a very particular way. If you come to our club, it's literally the most crooked club you'll ever meet in your entire life. We are, we'll chat for hours, we'll do more talking than training some nights, but it kind of just created, it's naturally created an inclusive atmosphere where everybody's different and we're not trying to change anybody and we're not, I don't, my, my thing that I say all the time is, I'm not tailoring you to my martial art, I'm tailoring my martial art to you. And it's kind of, it was all games and fun. And uh, three years ago, we decided to give the European Championships a go. And I was really terrified. I was like, we're going to make a fool of ourselves because, you know, we just laugh and we joke and we have fun with it. But can we really stand up to these people? I take it really seriously. But I really honed in on the whole aspect of it. How do they feel? Really talking to them about their emotions. Are you nervous? It's fine to be nervous. Instead of trying to, like, dumb it down. And if you're going to cry, cry. We've got tissues in the bag. And it was kind of to nurture it and we went and as a team of 10 we took back just under 70 medals and it was the single biggest medal hall for an entire country and we were just one team of 10 people and I still stand by that was really kind of the defining moment for me of actually we can really just love what we do we can not take life too seriously and give a nurturing environment where you can just be yourself and you can still achieve those great things if you so wish but if you also just want a place that you can grow up in I mean I see kids that longer than any teacher ever does you know my students that are with me for, I've got three that are still with me from the original six they went to university and I was broken hearted when they left me and they they text me all the time but as soon as they have a whole day from uni they're back and they're inspiring the kids that are left in the club and they have it's, it's just become a big family we always talk we have a tournament every Christmas and that's always like our you're coming home to visit your mum for Christmas sort of thing so they'll all come in and we'll, we'll sort of celebrate all the things they're doing but they're inspiring the kids around them with everything that they do not just the martial arts so these kids are looking at this kid that's gone to Cornwall to university they now want to go to university because this doesn't seem so terrifying and I think I've naturally just created a place where they're staying because it's just a happy space where the, there's no pressure to do stuff. You don't have to be a European champion. You can sort of just do what you want. But we're inclusive and we have a range of people, 
just because people knocked on the door one day and we adapted as they came in. But I'm, no, I'm not an expert, and there'll be someone who'll knock on the door next week that I don't know anything about their ability, I need to learn something new, and I'll just adapt and change that. But they're included within that wider family of kind of what, what I do, so that's, that's kind of us, I think, in a, in a nutshell. Thank you, guys. <laughs> really, really great. Thank you. So these guys have given us a snippet. Um, into what they do and we want to hand it over to you guys on your table now so um, in the next 10 minutes Nikki's waving 10 at me 10 minutes um, we just want you to get to know who's on your table so there's just one question that we want you to discuss which will be on the screens in a second oh I can do that myself can I? there we go um, and it's how have you been contributing to our shared vision of a more active county particularly focusing in this conversation around the least active um, communities or um, inequalities. So on your table, get to know the name, who you are, what you do, and then if you can answer that question, how have you been contributing to our shared vision of a more active county?